Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming on. I know this is the last session in the Learn Live AG segment, and it's really great to see so many people here. So I'm Martin from GIS. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about AI and education. But first, I want to take your picture, because it's always nice to do a little bit of role reversal. So I'm going to take a 360 selfie, which I'll, I'll tweet later on. So if you, if you want to enter into the spirit of it, maybe wave your arms around a little bit, go woo! You ready? Three, two, one, woo! <laughs> Excellent, thank you very much. The other thing that I would say is I'm having a go at recording this, which is what that phone is doing down there. So maybe if it works out, we'll stick that up on YouTube afterwards. We'll see if it works. It's all a little bit of an experiment. But it's very interesting to see what you know your the, the device you carry around in your pocket nowadays is actually capable of. So I'm going to talk to you today about AI and education. And you might say, what has this image got to do with it? I wonder if anybody I wonder if anybody knows. Have you seen this image before? Put your hand up if you've seen this image before somewhere. So I think is there one person over there? Yes. Yeah. So I can't ask you because it's too noisy here. What this is, is a little piece of work that Arup did, the construction firm. And what Arup did was they said, we're putting street lights up. I think it was a project in the Netherlands. We put lots of street lights up, but we use these components. And I sort of think that maybe there's a more effective way of doing it. Maybe there's a more efficient way. Maybe there's a way that uses less material, could be um, fabricated more rapidly, all these sorts of things. Maybe, maybe those things are possible. So when they started looking at 3D printing, when they started looking at machine learning, they evolved this humble bit of metal, which you know people have been using for their streetlights for, I don't know, maybe a hundred years. And it evolved into something that was quite hard to recognize. I mean, you look at this, this looks like a kind of congealed lump of melted metal. This is actually more efficient, it's cheaper to make, it's, it's more effective at doing that same job. But if you look at it, you couldn't necessarily recognize what it was for. You might look at that one and think that there's stuff will hook into it and maybe be some sort of structural support. Look at this one. Who knows what this is supposed to be? And I think this is a very interesting question for us about using uh, machine learning, about using artificial intelligence in education is that we just may not be able to recognize the algorithm. We may not be able to recognize what comes out of the AI. So if someone says, why did I fail? Or why are you recommending to me that I should take a particular course of education? I say, well, I don't know. I don't know. The, the computer just gave me this. And it says, hey, you know, don't go to university. It's never going to work. Why is that? I don't know. You just look like someone who's not going to succeed at university. And that's a hard thing to get to grips with. That's a new concept, I think, for, for most of us. But that's really a warm-up, and I'm going to talk about three things today. I'll say a little bit about um, GISC and what we're doing right now. Um, not too much, hopefully, I'll try and get the balance right. I'm going to talk about robots and machine learning, upstroke artificial intelligence. And if you're really perceptive, you might have noticed I have used a couple of David Bowie song titles there. I was really hoping that David Bowie would have written a song about robots, but I couldn't find one. So that's a placeholder for an as yet unwritten, and now sadly never to be written, David Bowie song all about robots. Um, talking of robots, has anybody seen this? Put your hand up if you've seen this video. It's only come out in the last couple of days, so you, you know what's coming next. I'm just going to uh, flip over to I'm going to flip over to YouTube to show you this if this works. So you know those um, annoying captures that you get on uh, web pages, right, where they are asked to prove that you're not a robot. Well, guess what? This robot can. <laughs> Deal with it. So that's just a bit of fun. But 
robots are, are here in a big way. A lot of robots that we see nowadays actually are, are powered by, they're powered by some element of artificial intelligence or machine learning, often, often hidden away behind the scenes. And I've picked up a few examples here. What I'd like to encourage you to do, if you have a, a phone or a tablet or a laptop that still has any charge left, which maybe, maybe I'm asking a very small number of people here, I've got um, a provocation for you, which is that I'd like to hear what you think about this. So there's a link there, bit.ly slash bet2017 E-D-A-I, at A-I. There's a Google Doc there. Go and, go and leave me your thoughts. I'd love to read your thoughts and your comments. And that gives you the opportunity to throw a few things in while I'm talking. So what could we use AI in education for? Well, there's, a, there's quite a few things. You can picture um, my own daughter up right now is doing a study on the phases of the moon. Her teacher sent her home and said, go and look up at the night sky. It's been really cloudy. We don't know actually what phase of the moon it is because we rarely see the moon right now. So quite a natural question to ask is, um, okay, Alexa, what, what phase of the moon is it? We can see that um, the tech that we think of as AI can actually be quite helpful in quite simple ways as a reference source, uh, maybe as a coach and trainer, and right now you don't get something like Google Home or Alexa coming along to you and saying, hey, you know what, it's time you practiced your French, or, you know, you've been, a bit like uh, notifications on your phone, you might get a notification that says you've been sent around a bit too much. What does an ed tech version of that look like? What's the educational push? Maybe it's that you need to do a bit more practicing or something. Maybe it's that actually we notice that your scores are not so good all of a sudden. You know you were looking pretty good for those differential equations. Maybe that's just a little bit too hard for you. Maybe we need to work with you. And maybe that's something that you could do with a device or a piece of software that has infinite patience that you couldn't do with a human being. I know I'm quite happy to sit down with my kids and talk to them about differential equations, but I, even I have other things to do. And some parents maybe wouldn't have a clue what those things were. Then we come on to something that we're starting to see more and more of with learning analytics, which is actually, um, I'm not worried about Martin. I, I've not seen him for ages. He doesn't seem to come to lectures. Um, he's not logged into any of our IT systems. Is he okay? Maybe someone should have a chat with him. So these are the kind of things that, I would say these are futures. These are things that we're, we're seeing to a greater or lesser degree already. I'd like to know what you think about these things. Do you think that this is the direction that we'll increasingly go in? What kind of ed tech notifications and pushes do you think the learners that you work with would value? And what kind of interventions do you think people would value? So stick your thoughts in that Google Doc. I'll come back to it at the end. It's so noisy here that it's actually very hard to hear anybody, even when we pass the mic around. So hopefully the Google Doc will be a useful tool. So I said I'd say a couple of words about GIS. Um, I won't go on in too much detail about this, but I think there's probably a couple of things, if you've not come across this before, uh, we run uh, the Janet Network in the UK. We have about 18 million users across schools, colleges and universities. Uh, we do sector deals and agreements, so we've done quite a few of those for things like uh, G Suite and Office 365. And right now we're doing a big program of work on learning analytics, digital capability, digital skills, and in research data, which may be less, less interesting to this audience. And we're in the middle of a phase that we call co-design, which is where we reach out to our members and we say, what would you like us to do next? And my job in all of this is partly to come to places like this and, and meet new people, but also behind the scenes to go away and look for new ideas, new trends, new technologies, things that we could usefully bring to our members. And I'll talk about a couple of those in a minute. Um, Worth saying about our learning analytics work, there's quite a bit of documentation there. We've done some uh, very, I, I think, very useful studies. There's some very useful reference material. If you're thinking about implementing learning analytics, we've done a review of not just UK practice, but international practice. We also worked with 
then analytics users and vendors to develop a code of conduct. And that's quite a simple thing now, I think, that as a potential user of learning analytics, you could come along and you could say, well, here's this code of conduct. As a supplier, what do you think? Are you, are you up for this? Will you agree that student data will be used in an ethical way, which is really what the code of conduct is about? And we also have, for, for UK people perhaps particularly, we have something called the Learning Analytics Network, which is a community group that meets fairly regularly. So the next meeting of that's in February. I've only got a, a blog where you can find out more about it. And actually, just yesterday, we announced uh, a major partnership with DTP and Excelsoft. And what we're trying to do is bring learning analytics system vendors into this community in a way that means that everybody can integrate with each other's products. So you come along as, at, say, Excelsoft, and you don't have to start from scratch. You don't have to spend a lot of time integrating your product. So this is really good news, and I, I think that you'll see a lot more of this. We'll also be working with startups and scale-ups, and we've got, we're in midway now through a startup competition where EdTech startups are pitching for some mentoring and support. They get some cash money, but they also get this package of support and guidance. And if you come to our digital festival in March, our DigiFest as we call it, um, you can hear the pitches from those startups, and maybe there'll be a product or company that really gets you fired up. One example of a startup that we've been working with, you might have seen uh, Professor Stephen Apple earlier on on one of the other stages, uh, Learnometer, which is all about gathering environmental data to improve learning outcomes. So you know we're talking about machine learning, we're talking about the AI. We've got to feed that with something. And actually, if you think about the environment, think this, this place that we're in now, it's very hot, it's about 80 dB, it's very noisy, you actually shouldn't spend any length of time in this environment. It's quite dangerous. It's hazardous to your health. And there are parallels with the places that our learners study, the places that they take their exams. So Learnometer is a, is a piece of hardware which has a whole bunch of sensors integrated in it. And the idea is we're working with uh, Professor Apple to mass produce these at quite a low price point. So as a school or a college or a university, you could buy a few of them and you could say, we're going to check out what's it like here and what's it like over there. And benchmark your own stats, not just from room to room, but also perhaps against your peers. So go and have a look and stand G100 or go to learnometer.net if you're interested in that. And in fact, we're collecting some examples of what people would like to do with it. So if you fancy telling us what you think that might be useful for, you could win one. That's enough of that. So that was kind of the sales pitch. And what I really want to talk about, robots, AI, and things like this. So it wasn't long ago at all that if you'd said robots, and particularly if you if you said humanoid robots, well, people would have said that's like, you know, a 1950s, 1960s science fiction trope. Um, humanoid robots, yeah, it's not really going to happen. Robots that look humanoid respond to you that you can have a conversation with. That's, that's you know, pretty unrealistic, not science fiction. So this is a robot called Pepper. As you can see from the text at the bottom, Pepper is already working. Pepper is a working robot, and Pepper works in a whole bunch of shops in Japan. So Pepper is the greeter in the SoftBank mobile phone stores in Japan. You come to the store and Pepper will, will greet you and will talk to you. Maybe ask you if you want to renew your contract or something like that. Um, Nestle are planning to introduce Pepper in their um, Nespresso coffee pod adverts. So you, can, you come into the shop and, and the robot will try and sell you an expensive coffee pod. Very interesting. Um, but what is it actually like? I've, I've got a, a video which I'll play you a little bit of. If you've not seen Pepper, this, this could be quite interesting. Beginning of a beautiful story. I like humans. 
What once existed only in the mind. Take your time to close the curtains. Take your time to close the curtains. And uh, the stop, stop, stop. So humans, humans are so cute. It really did say that. But it's okay because it's a little robot. It's not a great big scary robot. It's a cute little robot, so everything's fine, right? Um, another example of robots which I think is very interesting is how Amazon are using them. So again, probably a few of you have seen this, but for those who haven't, I'll just play you a few seconds of this video. Amazon liked this so much. This was a product from a company. Amazon bought the company because they liked it so much. So in Amazon warehouses now, increasingly, there, there aren't people walking around picking objects and putting them into baskets. The stuff moves to the humans, and these little robots tumble around, and they move the shelving and has the stuff over to the people. And now you have over 30,000 of these robots already. So robots actually are a are a bit of, bit of a, a big thing really. You know, we can look at the little Danbo here, the uh, cute Japanese um, Amazon robot uh, figurine. But actually, Amazon are using robots very strategically in a very big way. Um, that's not all though. Uh, I don't know if anybody's heard of the Amazon picking challenge. So this is the next step. Right now, Amazon are working with uh, top computer science teams uh, around the world in universities to devise algorithms and hardware that will let a robot picker grab particularly awkwardly shaped objects. Objects that are very delicate, objects that are very heavy, or just awkwardly shaped. When they do that, then maybe the handful of humans in the warehouse could just be re reduced down to a supervisor. So, you know, maybe one day you kind of thought, well, okay, I could always get a job in the Amazon warehouse but actually there might only be one job. So that's, that's quite thought-provoking. Um, it's also interesting to see what's happening with self-driving cars, and you might see the occasional bit of coverage where the media will say, oh well, self-driving cars are coming, you know, in a few years' time maybe this, this, this will come to pass. It's very interesting to see how Tesla have used their network of Tesla owners to prime the machine learning model which drives their autopilot product. So there's over 140 million miles that people have driven on autopilot, Tesla owners. Every time someone drives a mile on autopilot, the AI gets a mile's worth of data about different road conditions, road works, pedestrians, cyclists in different countries, in different cities, towns, rural neighborhoods. Hugely valuable. And there's already nearly 100,000 Teslas on the road sending all of this data back. So you might think right now that Tesla is a company making a, a luxury car, a very expensive boutique product. But this is the, the actual business model, is to, is to train the AI. And it may be, maybe that will become a little bit like the uh, Google car that we've probably all seen a prototype of. Well, maybe just become a taxi. You, know, you want a fancy limousine? Okay, the Tesla will roll up. And it's very interesting to see how Uber hired an entire autonomous vehicle team from the top US university to essentially be able to stand up something very similar to Tesla almost overnight. And we'll come back to that at the end. So there's a couple of other things to say about that. Has anybody seen this? Have you seen this? Oh, good. So, so there's the odd person that's seen this. I, I won't play you an internal number of videos, but I think this one is quite, quite fascinating to watch. So this is Google DeepMind AI, the thing which famously um, became world champion at Go, the uh, Chinese game. They trained it to play Breakout. They also trained it to play a few other games like Space Invaders. Um, how do you train an AI? Well, they basically said, if you get a good score, if you get a long game, you're doing it right. Over to you. So it just keeps playing completely blindly, completely naively. It doesn't know what the rules are, it just knows that if it had a long game, or maybe if it had a high score, you're doing something right. So, a few hundred games later, a few hundred games later, and it's figured out something that you, you or I will probably eventually figure out. We might play this game for years and suddenly. 
how the game practically plays itself. But if you said, what's the algorithm? I, I want to know how it does that. The algorithm would be a bit like trying to understand human evolution. You'd be looking at it and you'd be saying, I can't understand this. I have no idea what's going on here. It's, it's a complete mystery. And Google self-driving car is actually closer to um, being a real product that you might take out on the road than perhaps you would have thought. So let me, let me see if I can find the best bit here. So here we go. This overlay graphic to show you what the um, AI in the car actually sees. So the AI sees pedestrians, it sees cyclists, it sees obstacles. And there's a little flash there of, of what it sees. But perhaps the most powerful image of all here is this blind man going for his first car ride solo. So he, he trusts this with his life, which is quite a significant thing. And this is something he's never been able to do before. And as all of us grow older, you know, some people might be born blind, but so many of us find that we're no longer able to do this. So we can talk about dystopian applications of AI, but this is actually really hugely empowering. But we've got to move on, so I won't play you all of that. <laughs> So here's my third David Bowie um, song title. Does anyone remember that one? It's one of his less, less well-known ones. AI is quite alien. Machine learning is quite alien. The products of these algorithms, the products of um, generative algorithms are things that you just wouldn't necessarily recognize. Um, however, the, the kind of pattern matching that lets a car navigate through a busy city street without bumping into anything Actually, that technology, that power, can be used for all kinds of things. And we saw the example of the Amazon warehouse employee who might be looking for another job in a few years' time. This might turn out to be, you know, maybe not something that you can rely on. Will we all end up like this guy in San Francisco with his laptop and his sleeping bag in the shop doorway? Well, hopefully, if we keep our eyes open and we keep upskilling ourselves, we'll avoid that fate. But it is very interesting to see, particularly over in the States, this huge gap that's opened up between, let's say, the, the haves and the have-nots, the people who understand the technologies and how to exploit them, and the people who maybe feel that they've been left behind. And this should give us pause for thought. I'm also fascinated by these statistics coming out of China, so I don't know if you can read the bit at the bottom. Already 86% of Chinese high school students need glasses. So, you know, if you view that as a sort of harbinger, perhaps, of what we'll, we'll see around the world, um, are we leading to sedentary lifestyles? Do we need that prod that I talked about at the beginning, the AI that says, do you know what, I've been totting up all the things that you've been doing, and, you know, you just spend too much time staring at this small rectangle. It's time to get up. I'm going to switch it off now for you. No more screen time. Um, but that was that was kind of a, a negative view. It's kind of a dystopian view. And I think that the answer is actually that, that tech is for us to exploit. And so if we let the tech exploit us, if we let people who will use it ruthlessly exploit us, we will be exploited. But at the same time, technologies like AI, like VR, are hugely transformative, and I think we've probably all seen some great examples here at that over the last couple of days. So I think that we need to recognize that there will be completely new careers, and careers that we take for granted and probably change beyond all recognition. And I mean, I have a rather trite example here, but when I have a problem with my plumbing or my uh, electrics at home, I call an electrician in, I call a plumber in, in the smart home, those people, simply their, their trade, the daily trade that they ply, has changed and changed and changed with smart meters, um, with the Internet of Things, with connected light bulbs, you know, all of that stuff. What it means to be an electrician, what it means to be a plumber, it's evolving at a very rapid rate of knots. And this is what's particularly weird about the geopolitical environment right now, is that we have this this rise of what we would call popular populism, at the same time as the technology really just doesn't care. The technology transcends national boundaries. 
So on the one hand, we have uh, the UK Brexiting, and then on the other hand, we have Estonia saying, well, anyone can come and set up an e-residency here, start a business, you know, go for it. And uh, I got the Estonian e-residency card, and it was a completely painless process. I'm now a little bit Estonian, and that was a trivial thing to do. I can start a business in the EU, whatever the UK position is, don't care. Um, and that's the reality of technology. Technology doesn't respect these national boundaries. But I think if we steer it back to education, if we steer it back to learning, that point about portfolio careers and continuous learning, we can't just sit back and say, well, I went to college, I went to university, I've learned my trade, this is the trade that I apply. I think we'll all be doing something a bit like what Charles Handy called portfolio careers. You might do something for a few years and then find that technology has marched on so rapidly that with, with all of the knowledge that you acquire, those skills, that information that you put into your brain is no longer relevant. And back to Udacity and Uber. So remember I had that little thing about how Uber coached an entire self-driving um, car team. Well, people here are probably familiar with Udacity. Put your hand up if you if you know of Udacity. Yeah, so Udacity have been running these things they call um, nano degrees. And the idea is it's a very short, sharp, focused bit of learning, just the stuff you really need to know. And they recently launched this partnership with some big car companies, also with NVIDIA, who make the uh, GPU chips that power a lot of the machine learning and AI that we've been talking about. And bingo, almost overnight, 20,000 students all over the world. There's no, you know, but okay, there are some, there are some areas where there aren't many students, but actually there aren't many people in those areas either. Bang, all of those people say, yeah, I'm up for this. I, I want to learn about this. And I think that's a very powerful message. If you're an educator, if you're um, from an institution, and you're thinking about what courses should I be lining up, what things are people be interested in, the idea that people might come along, and they might come along from anywhere, and they might say, well, I don't want to come to your campus for three years or something like that. I just want, I want to know all about this technology. And I've got a laptop, and I've got broadband, you know, just, just tell me all about it. Get me to do some practical exercises, get me certification at the end that says I know about this stuff. Very, very interesting. But I wanted to steer it back to the stuff that I talked about right at the beginning. We, we could picture the reference material. We could picture a child sat there who's thinking, you know, I just didn't really understand that stuff. They talked about algebra today. I don't really understand that. Or we picture a, a university student who doesn't want to stand up in front of a, a huge class and say, do you know what? We didn't cover differential equations when I, when I was in, um, doing my A-levels. We, we just didn't do that. I have no idea what you're talking about. So those reference sources, the, the, the coaching aspect, if you've used an app like Duolingo, you're probably used to getting little notifications to say, hmm, you know, your winning streak is maybe going down a little bit, it's going to do some practicing. Um, interventions, interventions directed at your personal tutor, perhaps if you're at university. Um, we already see a little bit of this with learning analytics, did this really step up a notch? So I'm very interested in, in what you think about this. I'm going to flip over to the Google Doc, and I'm optimistic that a few people have put some comments in. If you want to have a chat, you can try that. Oh, there's a good question. If you want to do a little bit of a live q and in theory we have one minute. So I think what's probably best is if I, if I try and answer that question, and then if people want to come and have a chat with me afterwards, I'm not going anywhere, so I'd be happy to chat with you. So the question we had is, hey, hey, Barton, what is to be regarded as artificial in terms of intelligence? I think the point there is, actually, we don't know what intelligence is. So all of this AI, all of this machine learning that we, we talk about quite a lot right now, the truth is, we're doing pattern recognition on a massive scale. We're feeding millions of cat videos into um, a neural network. And then we can ask that question, you know, does this look like a cat video? So we might be feeding in 
data points about millions on learners' interactions with BLEs, with barrier systems in institutions, lecture attendance monitoring. And we might take that and we might say, does this student look like one of those students over there who did well? Or does this student look like one of these students who dropped out? And you know, maybe that, maybe that is as much as we could really expect. And perhaps that's why people like Elon Musk are so concerned about AI. Because if you picture an, you know, an autonomous border force, let's say, well, you look a little bit, no offense, but you look a little bit dodgy to me. You might just have to keep an eye on you. Who decides? And the fact that you can't look at the algorithm and then understand it is a huge issue there. So that's that's my start of the turn on that one, but I'd be very happy to stick around and chat with you. And thank you very much for having me.